evening and welcome everyone to this first edition of Clubs and Spades. Today, the club in focus is Stolligant Club, which is celebrating a milestone marked 125 years. The main clubhouse itself goes back by 240 years. This is a category one heritage building at par with Victoria Memorial, and possibly it was a home to royalty. It is a veritable haven, a country haven in the midst of a concrete jungle. It is home to really rich, rare flora and fauna. For example, the only rainbow eucalyptus tree in Calcutta is in Tolligant Club. It's right here. This is a club that is sports oriented, family friendly, pet friendly, and every member is really proud to be a part of this heritage. On the other hand, we have Calcutta Heritage Collective. A passion, a veritable passion for heritage runs through its collective veins. It inhales the desire to protect, preserve, and showcase our heritage and architecture with every breath. And today it presents to us the first clubs and spades. I'm really proud to be a member of both institutions on board today. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Ronin Roy, President, Tolligant Club. Hi, Ronin. Ms. Tanil Mukherjee, the CEO and managing member of Tolligant Club. Anil. And Dr. Arif Ahmed, trustee, the Prince Ghulam Muhammad. Estate. Ronin, why don't you give us the backstory of Tolly for a start? Thank you, Aindrila. Uh, well, as Aindrila just told you all, that uh, Tollygunge Club is a, a property that we should all be proud of, not just as members, but I think as Calcuttans. And uh, before I go any further, I mean, during the course of my presentation, I've actually uh, taken freely from a number of sources, and I'd like to acknowledge all of them. Uh, books by Pradeep and Amita Das, the uh, book that was released on the, from Tulliganj Club, uh, Calcutta 200 Years, the Basish Chakravarti, they've done Sen, Historic Wings, the Aviation Magazine, GM Kapoor and Intac, and obviously our inimitable Sudeep Dhara from the club, who's actually managed to go through a lot of our photo archives to try and give me the, the, the photographs we need this evening. So without further ado, basically the main clubhouse dates back, as Aindrila says, to 1781, which makes it almost 240 years old. Or in other words, we're actually going back to the time of Warren Hastings. And the club it, itself was founded 115 years ago. 115 years later, that's 125 years ago. So I think that there's a significant amount of history of the club that actually predates the foundation of the club itself. And the history of the clubhouse itself is closely linked to the history of the area as to Calcutta and India in general. So going back in time, the area that was known as Tolliganj now was known as Rasapagla in the 18th century. And in fact, this name was a derived from the Rasa tree under which the local Sufi peer known as Pagla Peer Baba was supposed to have meditated over 370 years ago. And in fact, you can still visit his tomb in Jubilee Park and it's still there. Mm. And Rasa Pagla was actually a very marshy jungle full of Sundari trees, vine trees and Gurjan trees. And in fact, an extension of the Sundarbans with only a few houses of the Europeans located here and there. And here you can see a photographic depiction of what it probably would have looked like in, eight, in the 1880s. In fact, you, Ron, in, sorry, yes. I was just going to say that some people say that this was the starting point for expeditions for the Sundarbans then. Well, I mean, we don't have any data on that, but uh, no. let, let, let's just go on. I mean, uh, looking at the Gobindapur Creek, which lined uh, uh, Rasapagla and was on the south of what is now Taliganj, was later known as Adi Ganga, and then it became Gobindapur Nala. In fact, it marked the southern boundary of Gobindapur village and of Calcutta. 
And the dead Adi Ganga was actually desilted and made navigable by Captain Colonel William Tolly in 1775 and became known as Tolly's Nala. And he also developed a market or a gunj in the area, which was called Tolly's Gunj, and hence the name Tolly Gunj. In fact, if you look at Tolly's Nala in the 1890s, it was a wide waterway. And in fact, uh, he developed the use of the waterway using his own funds, which is why the government allowed him to levy tolls for its use. In fact, almost seven times the amount of uh, cargo was moved by boat as compared to the rails. Yeah, and yeah. this continued to 1804, when the government actually took it over after his wife died. And Tolly's Nala remained navigable almost till the time of independence. But if you compare it to Tolly's Nala now, you can see that it's completely uh, silted over and you've got uh, residences coming up on either side, which is actually taken away from the beauty of the area. Uh, Ronin, did it go yeah. right up to Bangladesh till... Uh, uh... Uh, the time that it became silted over? Correct. Still, I mean, in fact... East Bengal, then. Correct. In fact, the, the main reason was that once the Nala opened, it actually connected all the eastern districts of what was then United Bengal hmm. to the port of Calcutta. In fact, it was uh, there's a huge amount of cargo movement that actually happened because of this. And uh, Colonel Tolly actually more than made up for his, the investment that he had made. Yeah. While yep. trying to uh, decent the Nala. In fact, the Ganj that had developed the market in the area began to attract a host of British settlers. And one of the main attractions was actually the Sundari trees, which gave the best wood for shafts and carriage wheels. And even though the area was, you know, infested with mosquitoes and creepy crawlies, Europeans loved uh, living in the central areas of old Calcutta, which was getting uh, very busy according to their times. Had become had a pension for villas far out in the sleepy villages. So this is where some of them began to look at country houses. Mm. And this is where the Tolly clubhouse history actually begins in this particular setting. In fact, according to the available evidence, the property was acquired by Richard Johnson in 1781 from a gentleman called Mr. H. Grant, which makes it at least 240 years old. Mm. We don't have any pictures from that time, but uh, as far as we know, this is the, uh, an artist's impression of what the Tolly Gunge Club would have probably looked like when Richard Johnson bought it. And this is an impression based on an actual floor plan. Mm. Unfortunately, we don't have any record as to who designed it or who actually was involved in the building of this magnificent structure. But what we do know is that Mr. Johnson joined the East India Company as a writer in 1769 and reached Calcutta in 1770. And he moved through various posts and he ultimately rose to become the resident of the court of Awad and re then resident of the Nizam of Hyderabad, which is when he left Calcutta. And his reputation, however, was shrouded by various shady deals. And his fortune saw many ups and downs, but Johnson repurchased the house in 1787 but then uh, three or four years later, he fell ill and actually left India and sold the house again. But we find that he actually returned to Calcutta uh, because uh, his name comes up in the Bengal calendar and register in 1801 and has him mm. listed as an indigo manufacturer. And uh, the property actually changed hands a number of times before he finally acquired it again around about 1800 for 3,600 Sikka rupees. So uh, that's the sum total that he played for this entire property. You can oh, see I have a question here, sorry, yeah. interrupting, because the popular, the popular misconception is that this was a indigo plantation, but it wasn't, right? You just said that it was listed as a factory? No, it was just a, he was just a manufacturer. He, he actually, he actually right. manufactured uh, uh, indigos elsewhere and, and sold it. So he actually yeah, never, he never actually ran a plantation in Tolligan's Club. So that is completely erroneous, actually. And I also wanted to point out that no indigo grew here in Calcutta. So Correct. that is something that should be corrected for people who've always believed that this is an indigo plantation. The indigo came from Bihar. 
and outside and it was worked on here correct i mean that is very very true so i mean this is one of the myths that sort of developed around the man earlier on has been carried down the years and he was actually very well placed in society and during his stay we actually had a number of dignitaries coming and visiting the club which included the painter joshua reynolds who happened to be his uh, grandfather relative yeah the yeah, relative john owen the chaplain in the garrison uh, in fort william then the founder of the asiatic society william jones and more interestingly marianne who actually subsequently became the second wife of warren hastings so i mean there's a lot of intrigue involved over there so we don't know what actually happened in tully in those times mm. but johnson uh, finally returned to england uh, again uh, he'd lost most of his money by then and he died in brighton and uh, is buried there in 1807 and his property in calcutta reverted to the east india company and in 1809 the titles were actually transferred to lieutenant colonel hawkins and gaffrey for the accommodation of the mysore princes but i think uh, i'd like to stop over there because i think we've got someone very interesting to take uh, this story forward before then before you move on a question yes. So sure. we're supposed to have to both Anil and you. We're supposed to have graves. We do have graves at the far end of the grounds of Tolly, which Correct. were again believed to be the Johnsons' graves, and that is not true, is it? That that is again a complete myth. First and foremost, the graves aren't Christian in uh, yeah. appearance. No crosses. Nothing at all. And uh, the the the. the tablets that are there are, are subsequent additions so we really don't know exactly who's buried there i mean there are a number of theories it could be uh, johnson's so called indian family members mm-hmm. might be there there might be some other local uh, people who might be buried there they're more islamic in style than they are christian to be very honest and uh, the bottom line is we don't know who they are but it's definitely not the johnsons because they were act- they are buried in brighton and that is a known fact Thanks. Right, so I'll stop my screen share over there. And uh, Arif, do you want to take over from here? Why not? What an exciting time to take it over. And uh, if you all might have noticed, uh, there was a picture on uh, Doctor's slide, which was essentially a picture of two young boy being handed over to a, a British gentleman, who was subsequently known as Lord mm-hmm. Cornwallis. the story actually goes back a lot the story goes back a lot in the sense on the 4th of may 1799 tipu sultan died in the battlefield and on 19th of june as you can see how fast they were the entire family of tipu sultan was moved out to velour because they considered that if a progeny of tipu sultan lives there they can perhaps inspire people for a freedom struggle Mm-hmm. but the story as i said was much earlier in 1793 after the end of the third anglo mysore war tipu sultan's mm-hmm. two child were kept if i may use the word as a ransom by the english they were held hostage hostage by them and they would not be released till tipu sultan paid the dues of the war you can see there are some famous pictures here here are the two children a bidding goodbye to their mother and then the story continued and you would of course notice here i would like to point out to one mystery character here if you see there's an elderly gentleman with a white beard standing behind the two children and in almost all the pictures that you'd see of this handover now here is the one where they're being handed over to the british the same gentleman stands there this gentleman had a tremendous influence over the family and most likely though not clearly identified he was known as gulam ali he was one of the trusted mm-hmm. lieutenants of tipu sultan the story went on the family went on to velour and i have a quote here from the book called the tiger of mysore where they say mysoreans in exile that almost 3000 people living there around what is known as the velour fort today but then the inevitable happened on 9th of july 1809 tipu sultan's daughter was being wedded 
and a revolt began. The Union Jack was brought down, Tipu Sultan's flag fluttered over it, and arguably, this was perhaps the first war of independence in India. It didn't last long. And the flag that was flown over the fort came from Tipu's child called Muizuddin, and that kind of marked him as one of the propagators of that rebellion. On July 10th, a cavalry moved around. They stopped the mutineers from forwarding anywhere, vanquished them, and within a matter of days, the major children, the other picture that you see here was Abdul Khalik, and these were the, considered to be the two people who spearheaded that rebellion, though there is no historical fact, there's no historical evidence behind them. And then came the time the British realized that they must be moved out. So on the August 28th, 1806, around 52 people were routed to the Madras, then it was Madras by sea, not even inland, to be kept under what they called close confinement, which is essentially an euphemism for keeping being a prisoner. And they were shifted to the place which uh, Dr. Roy just described was known as Rasa Pagla. And you can see one of the pictures here of one of the famous uh, ponds there that used to exist in that area. The story of the family was not a very happy one. One of the favorites of Tipu, Abdul Khalik, whose picture you saw earlier, died at the age of 24th on the 12th of September in the Sandheads approaching Kolkata or Calcutta as we would call that time, which would likely to be the Sundarbans. His seventh son, Muizuddin, from where the flag went, he was kept in again, as you said, the close confinement with his third son, Tipu's third son, his younger brother, Muyuddin, at the Greater Calcutta Jail. Please note, there are lots of evidences that Rasa Pagla had a detention center at that point of time. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have found some documents which speaks about the detention center, but we're not very sure whether the same detention, detention center subsequently grew up or was known as the Great Calcutta Jail. But never mind, he was confined there from 1806 to 1813, and then he was released on June 25th. Then the, suddenly the links kind of dry off. You do not hear of anybody else till, as we say, the rise of the 11th son of Tipu Sultan, 11th surviving son of Tipu Sultan, the Prince Ghulam Muhammad, who is the centerpiece of that activities of rejuvenation of that place, Rasa Pagla. What he did, Prince Ghulam Muhammad, he kind of patched up with the British. He even negotiated with them, secured a financial support. Mind you, when the family was removed from Velour, the condition was, they were said, that you were being shifted to Calcutta in lieu of their pension. The family was not supposed to get any further pension. However, Prince Ghulam Muhammad negotiated and arranged a pension. This, the letter you see beyond is a very interesting letter for people. There's a gentleman is talking about payment of Sikha 395 for the repair of the guard room at the Rasa Pagla detention facilities, not a detention center, but detention facilities for the family. And it uh, dates around 1836. Arif, yes, please. I have a question here. Uh, this is what you consider the documentation for the fact that he was at Tolly. There's no other actual proof, right? Well, there are proof because the lands were given to them. But what happened that where exactly was his hmm. king? Now, there yeah. is no, you know, Pacha or Pacha, as we would call them, or tax record stating that this was the building. We have to remember, he did not have ownership. Mm -hmm. And he was a prisoner, mm -hmm. so-called prisoner, as I said, close confinement. Since he was not technically a prisoner, it is almost impossible to find a written documentation in terms of his being in prison. And since he was not a landowner, no land mm -hmm. did exist in his name. So that's now, a bit this, like Wajid Ali Shah. That's correct. Now, this is one of the proof of talking about a guard room, which kind of contextually meets the definition of an area where there is a building and there's a gate and there is a guard room standing up there. 
the period the building that existed during that period mm. none the, the meets this description as well as the Chaligan clubhouse club clubhouse does so mm. though it is circumstantial but and also from the the family members who are the members of this uh, particular club the the legacy of uh, uh, prince gulam mahmud like uh, anwar ali shah or uh, mm. humayun ali mirza mm. who are the descendants of this family they have heard from their ancestors that this was the property where prince gulam mahmud stayed and died after he procured it mm. right now interestingly you said he went to england also he patched up with the english well and if you'd find in one of his letter which i've not bought in here one of his note uh, written to the written to queen victoria in the same letter he had eloquently covered paid homage to his father for his valor mm. recognized that they were vanquished stressed on their friendship with the british and never never in the letter was he ever submissive to the british there's a wonderful piece of writing which he sent to queen victoria saying that in my own right i am a regal it's a different issue altogether that i have lost the war with you but my right as a regal is not something that can be compromised and you'll see here here's a letter from him which he wrote while he was in uh, uh, england in, in london in fact in uh, june 1854 he's writing the letter to a did the judge thanking him informing him that he has reached london and also thanking him for protecting the family the mysore family from the oppression of the unjust magistrate mm. the gentleman is writing to was the judge in the diden uh, supreme court of uh, british india which was in the sad district who was a judge there so you can understand the amount of social clout that mm. prince gulam mahmud effectively conjured up and then he did something which was unbelievable this is what you are seeing is a page of the from the ledger of the british east india company he managed he negotiated and he got a settlement in 1860 of 500000 british pounds Gosh. you can imagine the sum the volume of money that he got 500000 british pounds in 1860 as a one time permanent endowment for the family so not only did he get the pension restored he was a person who spent well he educated himself well and he invested very well this money was invested all across calcutta picked up various buildings in fact the building that you know as the shawalis building at 4 and 5 bank street yes. is yes. also belonging was also purchased by him and he somehow a kind of a poetic justice he purchased all those very lands where his family was confined mm -hmm. he bought them up and that's when for the first time his name appears on the land deed as owner mm -hmm. he set up a royal uh, family court the royal court which was known as the barabagh and this is allegedly the present toligunj club now this is again i quoted from a, a book the last king of india dutch books about wajid ali shah is very interesting because wajid ali shah was moved into calcutta in the mid 1800 mm. and in fact this 500000 endowment to the tipu sultan's family members shocked mm. everybody including the others includes wajid ali shah and everybody else though they had befriended themselves and they were finally tied with a marriage so there was a marriage between this family yeah. the a great grandchild of uh, prince gulam mahmud got married to the son of uh, wajid ali and that dynastical representation is still there in this management committee uh, i have a question arif that is a huge amount even today absolutely so at that time it was an absolutely obscene amount of money indeed so even after he bought over all the property around taliganj club etc even after he bought over many buildings there was plenty left over why did the family's fortune decline financially so badly how was it all mismanaged blown up what did he do with the rest of the money did well, he set up trusts 
Yeah, Prince Gulam Mahmud yeah. had a kind of a foresight. In one of the area that he did, he had set up those two Tipu Sultan mosques that uh, adorns the Calcutta skyline today. Two mm -hmm. of the fine examples of Indo-Persian structure. And he dedicated it to his father. And the older one was in around 1832, long before he got this endowment. Mm -hmm. What he did, he broke up his this family, the endowment, into upkeepment of the family. He was officially recognized as the representative of the family. Okay. So he created two trusts, one for the welfare of the family, which still exists. The other one was for the welfare of the people. And that's when he created the walk of estate of Prince Gulam Muhammad in 1872. He endowed a fund there and mm. he kind of disenfranchised his family members to have any priority from this fund. This fund was created for common people. And so that they benefit of all faiths or just for one faith? religion. Please remember, he inherited the secularism from his father, though there's a lot of questions about it now, yeah. are being raised about it now. But not many people know that the Tipu Sultan was a protector of Sangnari Mat, one of the Sankaracharya's Mats in India. Mm -hmm. So he inherited the secularism from his father or the family friending, and it continued. I've shown you a picture here. Not many people are aware that he was the member of the first Senate of the University of Calcutta. I have quoted a document here where you could see that the author writes, also, I have observed that he had come across and heard about a special charity of Prince Gulam Muhammad, which may have been you know, provided not only to the lepers, but to the blind and the deaf. Mm. He not only educated himself, but he recognized his views to the society and set up this trust, invested in uh, education and contributed directly. In fact, the, the Bangur hospital that you see today bought up on a land which he had donated for that purpose. Does the uh, trust still exist? Yes, the trust is very much so now. I mean, in fact, that, that is the same trust uh, uh, of which I'm the trustee. And anyone can access it? Anybody can. So I think that is remarkable. And we really need to emphasize that, especially in today's India and today's world, where there's so much intolerance, so much not coming together, that here was somebody who in the 19th century put up this trust, which was for everybody of every faith and every denomination. I often mention that this is perhaps, perhaps the only religious trust which operates in a secular way. And the, and the tradition still continues there. In fact, you'd be happy to note that during the Eid festival, when the clothes are distributed, since around the vicinity of Toliganj, there's a large number of non-Muslims who reside there, quite a significant part of that clothes distribution actually goes to non-Muslim faith bearers. And that is done without any protest or without anybody coming up and saying why this should be done. There's a tradition of this particular trust. In fact, there's a tradition of this great country. The final part of Prince Gulam Muhammad was perhaps what he did. He was a very sociable man. In fact, if you find uh, the newspaper Pioneer reports in January 1867, I'm just quoting from there, they said, Prince Gulam Muhammad's ball comes off on 15 and is sure to be most enjoyable. He used to have the social gatherings, he used to host the ball, and there would be people of the various rank from the English uh, dominion who would mm -hmm. come and attend his social function. So that's what the fine story of a person whose father died when he was four years old, and he was sent over to Valor, sent over to Calcutta, was shadowed by his elder brothers, and then when the finally was kind of without a parent, he rose to the occasion, patched up with the British, educated himself, and so much so that on 18th May, 1870, two years before his death, he mm -hmm. was knighted by Queen Victoria. He was given the Knight Commander of the Order of the Star of India. So what a fascinating story of a person. And this is where the relationship between this particular family 
the entire area of Tolliganj and specifically Tolliganj Club is there. How was Prince Anwar Shah related to him? Well, Prince Anwar Shah was one of the descendants of the family in whom this particular name that you would see. Though there are certain quotations which talks about that Prince Gulam Muhammad was known as Prince Gulam Muhammad Anwar Ali Shah, but which oh. I believe does not fit in the historical annals because this name is not repeated in most of the places. But there is an Anwar Shah who was subsequently was a descendant of the family. And on a lighter note, there's another Anwar Shah who's right now the member of this family and descendant of the Tipu Sultan. And that's what his Thanks story so much, is. Ari. And that's what I think that uh, we hand it back again uh, to Doctor to continue the story of this uh, club. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ali. Pleasure. I'll go back to the screen share if I may. Yeah. Right. Uh, where are we now? You know, while he's coming on, I just want to uh, go back to an anecdote about Tolly. He's on. So you want to? No. That's no, I just, a couple, just in one second. Yeah, I think okay, okay. I found it. Yeah. yeah he's this. Right, um, and uh, so coming back to uh, after the death of uh, Gulam Muhammad Shah, his property is actually included as uh, Arif just told us what was known as the Baraba, yeah. and this was included an area of 305 bigas of land with a large upper room house and several smaller houses, and this was later become Toliganj Club. And along with that, he actually had another built, uh, smaller uh, garden house, the Kacheri Bar, which was a much smaller estate, which actually went on to become the part of the Royal Calcutta Golf Club. So actually, most of the surrounding area uh, around both these clubs in Taliganj actually belonged to Prince Gulam Muhammad Shah. So he actually had a huge estate. And uh, he's buried at the family cemetery uh, in Kaligar. So he's not uh, buried in uh, Rasa Pagla, but he's very close by. But coming next to the genesis of the clubs in Calcutta, I think it's interesting to see that uh, the, the clubs that started initially were more towards the center of the city. You have uh, almost 100 years earlier than, more than 100 years earlier than Tolligan's club, you had the CCFC in 1792, mm. the Rackets Club, which came up in 1793, the Bengal Club in 1827, which was basically a business club, really. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, Royal Calcutta Golf Club came up in 1829, again in our environs. Horse racing was mainly at the Calcutta Turf Club, that was in 1847. And the CRCO came up for the rowing in 1858. The swimming club, the CSC in 1887. But the Tolliganj Club was the, probably the first country club that came up in 1895. So that's actually how the clubs uh, started during the British era. And coming to the Tolliganj Club, our founder our president was uh, William Dixon Crookshank. And uh, he has uh, to his credit that he was actually probably the only president who remained president for 10 years. Mm -hmm. so I don't think that's a very enviable proposition in today's day and age. And uh, he was actually the secretary and treasurer of the Bank of Bengal which is the predecessor of the Imperial Bank and the State Bank of India. And legend has it that he actually stumbled on the Johnson property when he went around looking for his dog, which he'd lost when he'd gone out riding. So it's fortuitous that he lost it because that's when the idea of buying Tolligan's Club came about. And uh, the other founder trustee was called John Alexander Anderson, uh, who worked for Finley Muir and Company, which later became James Finley. And the club was formed by these two gentlemen in, uh, on the 1st of January in 1895. And two, nine, two months later, on the 20th of February, Crookshank and Anderson signed a lease with the Waqf Endowment Trust of Ghulam Muhammad Shah, as Arif had said. And initially, the uh, in agreement was for a period of 10 years. And the club was registered during this period on the 1st of October, the, uh, 1909, with the registrar of companies 
And in 1909, the club expanded by purchase of additional freehold land of about 30 acres to make it a much larger property. And from 1934, the lease was actually changed to a permanent lease with, from the district course of court of 24 Parganas to enter into a permanent lease with the trust. And an annual rent was agreed on, and we still remained uh, lessees from the work board and pay them a regular rent. This is the aerial photograph of Tolligan's Club showing the clubhouse and other ancillary bin buildings at the time. As you probably see, but then you don't see much of a boundary wall. In fact, a uh, boundary wall came up somewhere in the early 1950s. And before that, it was just open. So uh, the jackals that you see around in Tulligan Club probably had a free flow, uh, free run of the land all around. In fact, riders in those days could just come in and out of the club wherever they wanted to. And uh, if you compare this with the photograph taken about a year, uh, 10 years ago, that's about 60 years later, you can see that we're now in the middle of a concrete jungle. So that's how Tolligan's actually evolved in the last 60 years. So at this point, I think I'd leave it on to Anil to talk about the rest of the exciting stuff that happened in the club. Ronin, yes. before uh, Anil starts, I just because of the greenery, I just wanted to ask Arif one question. I believe there was a certain mango tree that came from the south with Tipu Sultan's uh, uh, descendants. The mangoes were about a quarter of the size of our mangoes. There was an aromatic, uh, there was a floral aroma about it. And do you know about this tree, Anil? Arif? Uh, we have it at Taligan's Club. Or we had it, I don't know. Arif? Yep, I mean, I have also heard about it as a part of the legend. Unfortunately, okay. I have not been, I have not tested those mangoes. And uh, can is a possibility there because there are such old mango trees in uh, the Bangalore or Mysore, which was planted by Tipu Sultan. And one of them just, you know, went down, which was about 250 years old. So it's, it's very much possible that it might have come down here. But uh, I have not come across any record of exactly where it was or where it could have yeah, It was the only tree of its kind in Calcutta, I believe. In fact, a lot of what is grown, seen at Tolliganj Club came from as far off as South America. Anil would be able to tell us about that. Anil, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Angola, and thank you, Ronan. And Arif, you know, you've taken us to a very interesting journey about Tolly. And cut to the chase, we're now coming into the 20th century. And what a lot of people are not aware is that the first, amongst the arguably one of the first times an aircraft or an aeroplane took off was at the Taliban's club. And that was in 1910, okay. on the 20th of December. Let's not forget that uh, the Wright brothers had, you know, taken the first flight in 1903 at Kitty Hawk. And Calcutta was still the, the capital of, of British India second city of the empire, and Tolligan's club was the bastion of the British at that time. So, Ronan, you had some very interesting slides. Now, ask you to show the next one. Now, why did they fly in, in you know, they're arguably it's one of the first places. They, they went to um, Allahabad, but there was some controversy there, the devil of bureaucracy, and they came to, to India, and they came to Bengal, and they came to Calcutta. And we've had we had the the all the you know the, the uh, creme de la creme of British society, and interestingly, some Indians who we'll 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 show you now, who were actually a part of the first flight, and this was the aviation meeting that took place. And interestingly, we did not know, and to the best of my knowledge, I've been mem a member for over decades, and I've spoken to members who were far senior to me. They were also not aware that we were one of the first places that you know, a flight had taken place. And we did, and we do intend uh, to create some kind of tablet to this because it is really a historic moment. Um, and this was the ticket. Now here we have the people who actually took, who actually participated and who were there. And we have this 
lady, Mrs. Sen. And who is this Mrs. Sen? We are, there was a lot of mystery over that. Ronan, am I right? There was a lot of mystery Correct. over that. Mm -hmm. And would you like to add to that, that who Mrs. Sen was? Well, I mean, the thing is that all we know at the time, the record show that she was a Mrs. N.C. Sen. And uh, who Mrs. N.C. Sen was, was a question mark till uh, a lot of research was done, I think, over the last couple of years. And uh, the identity of Mrs. Sen has finally been revealed. So, in fact, uh, over here, you can see that uh, on the reverse of the ticket that was found, and this was actually sold, uh, bought by this gentleman, uh, Dennis Reed, in 2017. In, uh, on an uh, eBay auction. And on the reverse of this, he found that there was this handwritten note saying that the name of, names of the people who uh, actually took part in the flight, and you can see there that Mrs. Sen's name was top of the list, and she actually went up a week earlier than the others. So uh, she was probably the first lady to actually fly. And this is actually the identity of Mrs. Sen. Anil, back to you. Well, Mrs. Sen, as she later married Nirmal Chandra Sen, oh. and I think of the famous Bengali philosopher Keshav Chandra Sen from the Brahma Samaj. So, and uh, one of the first prominent cases of widow remarriage. So, there's, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of the evolution of India, a lot of the evolution of Bengal, and um, it really is, is, is a golden moment of, of Trolley's history. Um, what else would be, you know, the, the, it's all here for you and how she went up and how important it's, I think she found it. And really, I think Ronan would be the person who could take us through this. Well, actually, uh, it's interesting in the sense that the gentleman who was uh, uh, researching this was a gentleman called Devas, Devashis Chakravarti. And in fact, he came to Taligan's club and, uh, our uh, deputy CEO at the time actually struck up a conversation with him. And he said, where's the plaque that uh, uh, commemorates the flight? And he said, what flight? And uh, so, we, you know, none of us knew what was going on. And so we, that's how, when the questions actually arose. And then finally, he managed to trace down uh, Devdan Sen, who's actually the grandson of uh, Mrs. Mrinalini Sen. And she's settled, he's settled now in England, in Guildford. And, and he sent the, the uh, photographs of his uh, grandmother's uh, autobiography and where he actually, she actually describes the flight at, at the Tolligan's Club. In fact, she went up with Baron Decatur, who was one of the Belgian elevators and flew for a total of 27 minutes, which was a pretty long flight for those days. And she was quite a woman by all accounts. She, she met A.G. Wells. She traveled all around Europe. She was really a flyer for her times in every sense of the word. Back to you, Anil. Okay, so now uh, I would I think we, we've, we've passed the flight bit because it, it is a historical moment. And it, uh, but I think we would come into modern Tolly. And Tolly was first and foremost a sports club. And fundamentally an equestrian club, a riding club. That's how we started. And it's very interesting to know that you were a gentleman rider and you were a gentleman rider because you couldn't win more than 99 rupees. If you won more than 99 rupees, you became professional. So, you know, it was the bastion of amateur riding uh, was, was tough. And we've had some very eminent personalities who have visited and graced Tolly in those days. We must remember, after all, it was, you know, it was British India. So, the Gymkhana races started far back as 1927. The, you know, we've had great personalities, the Prince of Wales, you had the Viceroys and all of that. And that tradition carried on into, into modern India, into mm -hmm. modern Tolly, many of us are familiar with. There, of course, a legendary, and riding was, 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 was Tolly's DNA at that time. Of course, golf had already started. The Wright family, the legendary Bob Wright, Anne Wright, Belinda, a lot of us know them. Ms. P. L. Roy, or Hurricane Roy, and Mr. K. K. Datta Gupta, who both became mm -hmm. presidents of the club. They were very much part of the riding. Jaraya Sankar Sarya, I think he needs no introduction. He's, been, he's one of Calcutta and India's eminent surgeons. He's an outstanding rider. His father played a major part in this. 
There was Gabby Lani, now Gabby Duneja, who we all know, and Nafisa. Ali needs no introduction to anybody. She was a national swimmer, and she took to riding like a duck takes to water. She was an outstanding uh, rider. We had Sonia Jabbar, we had the, the Greval family, names that we're all familiar with. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Vivek Patel, the late Vivek Patel. Here you got photographs of Darius and Goli, right on Darius and Kasaria. And that's the excellent, popularly known as Goli. If you see Darius's dad is there as well. Sorry? Darius's dad is there on the bottom photograph. Yeah, Darius's dad is there on yeah. the lower photograph. Uh, but I was talking about the upper one, there's that bully, that slim, silk looking chap. Most of us who know him today, you wouldn't be able to recognize him. I keep pulling his leg. And he looks nothing like that. And I'm sure that was his other brother. But uh, yes, riding is, was our, our DNA. We are a sports club and have been a sports club. And then from there, this... this Anil was riding the yeah. first spot. Yeah, Anil riding was, was our riding first the first spot. The riding was our first sport, yes. And yes. the tradition carries on, Angela. We've got, today we have over 40 horses, and we've had young people who have represented, we've had Ashray Bhutta, who represented India in the Asian Games. We've had Biran Gay, we've had Adiraj Mukherjee, uh, we've had Ranak Banerjee, who have represented, carry on the tradition, have represented India in international events. And I'm happy to say that, that riding is live and well here. We have 40 horses, and we are still nurturing the sport. And we are, you know, producing riders who go on to bigger things. Uh, Charlie has been the, the, the center of riding in Eastern India. In fact, we have held several national uh, championships in the last mm -hmm. 20 years, 25 years, and before that. And we continue to do that. We've had four junior nationals. We had the senior national jumping. Tent pegging was very much a part of our tradition. And Undrila, you will remember the good old Christmas days when, you know, on Christmas night and 31st, we used to have the, the yeah. you know, tent, tent pegging. pegging. Yeah. And Bob, you know, who and his famous horse, Rani, who was Rani, allowed into the who bar. Rani, took him to the pub yeah. at the bar. So yeah. Bob got into the bar and nobody would say a word. We were always, yeah. as you said, an animal friendly club. And uh, Rani was, of course, very special, as was Julie, the, the uh, dog. Dog, and you couldn't call a trolley dog a stray dog because they were never stray, they were part of trolley. So these, these traditions are very, very typically trolley. I, I don't think you can arguably see them anywhere else. And, uh, you know, as I said, we've had very eminent people. I would also like to talk in terms of what happened to the other sports because from that came golf. And if you look at what, you know, we were one of the founding members of the Indian Golf Union. Uh, which today, of course, there's a lot of other issues about the IGU, but along with the Royal Calcutta Golf Club and a couple of others, we were the, uh, you know, one of the founding members of golf. And that tradition has carried on. We've got outstanding names. We've got Mr. We Patwal, we have Ganji, we have Mr. Uh, Indrajit Bhalotia, we've got Vandana Agarwal, you know, series of, of sports people. So, who have reached very, very high levels of the sport. And whilst we are a recreational club, there is a commitment to sport, and I, I do hope as a die in the heart, Taliwala, that we don't move away from our moorings. Yeah, we are recreational, we play sport, we do all of that, but mm -hmm. our heart and soul should be in ensuring that that kind of tradition carries on. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure in time to come. Anil, we will. just one question, because we Anil. know that Tolly, the jackals are famous, but there's a whole yeah. lot of really rare birds and uh, uh, other animals and uh, uh, reptiles, etc. So if you could just say a word, a, a couple of lines about that. I think, Andrela, you you are a, are a member of long standing, and I think it's it's in our DNA and it's, it's in our conscience it that is. we are not just we are, we are we are not just a club for. You know, yeah. the British have gone and the new India has taken over. We have a sense of commitment to our environment, perhaps. Yeah. And I, I, I may be bored to say, perhaps we are more sensitive and more conscious than many other institutions. Some would say in the club, we need to be even more conscious, you know, sensitive. And uh, like we use a lot of organic stuff we, because we want to protect our, our flora and fauna. We have spent a lot of money to ensure a water system, which again, we are working on right now, so we don't have to draw water from the earth. We are recycling, we are, we are, you know, we are grain harvesting. Uh, after we've got our jackals, of course, which are famous. We have 
We've had the Muir Falcon coming here, the only time it was sighted in Calcutta, yeah. and the photograph yeah. was taken by Dr. Chaival Sen, one of our former presidents. And we've put it on our coffee mugs, and those are the most popular ones we have. Um, so, yes, very much, and we see ourselves as a lung of Calcutta. We, we see that, it's a, we have a sense of responsibility uh, of, you know, to our ecology, and we don't, we don't, you know, it's part of the Tali tradition and Tali ethos. Okay, I'm just looking at this. Ronin, do you want to say something? We've got a lot of questions coming in. Well, well, basically, I, because it's our one, uh, 125th year, I was looking at the celebration that we had 75 years ago. And okay. you can see the invitation card and, uh, and actually a dance program that actually had uh, uh, various dances at the different times that were going to be held. Mm -hmm. And along with that, this is the menu that they had for their celebration, which looks tame by our standards, really, because the sort yeah. of the menus that we have nowadays uh, are uh, at least uh, three oh. times as long, if not even longer. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and the best part of it I like was that breakfast was going to be served at 1 a.m. So you had soup, sausages, egg and bacon and beer at 1 a.m. after your dancing. So uh, it, those were good times, I'm sure. Okay, should we go for, uh, take a couple of questions quickly? Everyone? Sure. Okay, there's an interesting one here from Supriya Nebar. What was the membership fee when the club started first, taking members? Well, initially, as far as I recall, the, the, the club actually sold the ventures. Correct, correct Anil? Uh, uh, right at the very beginning when the club was started. Uh, and yes. Yeah, so you had a shareholding, is that what you're saying? A shareholding, but the, that, uh, I, I'm not sure when that stopped. I mean, that was in uh, probably the uh, early part of the century that it stopped. But okay, uh, okay. Now, not now after 1910 or 1912, but I'll need to look and check into the books. But I'm not sure of the first, uh, I mean, recent Indian members started around about 64, 65, I think. And I'm not sure what the permanent membership fees in those times were. Anil, any ideas? You paid a ridiculous sum when you joined. I'm not sure, but I, I do know that the first, you know, there was, it'd be interesting if you talk to some of our our, our old Indian members, who are like Mr. Home Paul and people like that. Uh, for a long time, Indians were, even in an independent India, they were, they were being made members, but they were not permanent members. Mr. Paul, I know for a fact, because we have him in our, in our book and we, we interviewed him for our 125th. He was one of the first permanent members in India way back in 1978. So it was as early late as that, that, that Indians were really coming into, into their own and got But what were the fees? I would not know. So I think uh, the, you had associate members before that, but you didn't have so permanent members. members, yes. And not permanent members. Well, there's no. a related question about membership. This is to both of you. What was the criteria Initially, for membership, this is from Rupande Shah. Well, I mean, the criteria hasn't changed at all. In fact, as far as I recall, uh, the only thing is that the gentleman uh, needed to be acceptable in Calcutta society. And that's it. Nothing more than that. Uh, observation I from Moshumi Pakrashi, she wants confirmation. <clears throat> Did Jogesh Chandra College on Anwar Shah Road also belong to Tipu Sultan's family? I think Arif might be able Arif. to give some light on that. Well, it's extremely possible. I mean, though I'm not very sure about it, because that entire track of land belonged to the, the Prince uh, Gulam Muhammad Shah and the family of the Tipu Sultan, including the part which we know as the golf green today. That entire track of land was a uh, family holding of them which was finally consolidated by Prince Gulam Mohammed. Okay. A um, uh, question from Smita Ray. <clears throat> Is there documentation on the flora and fauna of Tolly? Anil, uh, uh, Ronin, there's a book. Correct. Who, can you give me the there author's are... name? Yes, sure. Just a second. I'll, I'll get them for you. Okay. There are, uh, while Ron is coming, uh, on yeah. the, actually there are, there's not one book, there are three or four books okay. on the flora and fauna of Tali, but since Ronan has gone to get them for you, we'll wait. Uh, 
um, yes. you know, there's not just one single book. Dolly was also a, uh, an up to an extent even to today. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, a reserve for, for butterflies. So there's a time of year that you see yeah. phenomenal butterflies. Well, I'll just hold them up for you. This is the book on the birds and butterflies, uh, the butterflies and wildflowers of Dolly. I hope Smitha is watching this. And this That's is by a gentleman by, uh, by the name of Arjun Basu Roy. Uh, there's another book by Kushal on the uh, birds and uh, trees of Tolly. Yeah. And uh, there's another book by Gaurav Pundir, uh, our superintendent, along with Mr. Nathani, called The Trees of Tolly. So and all these books should be available in our uh, pro shop, actually, uh, okay. as far as okay. I'm aware. Yeah. So, members of Tolly, the books are available here at the Tolly Pro Shop. Otherwise, you can always get someone to buy it for you. Uh, question, should I carry on quickly? Yeah, please. Since the questions are coming in. Rupande Shah again, sorry. Anjum uh, Katyal, I can answer that. She asks, is Devdan Sen the one who was a member of Great Bear? Yes, that is the uh, Devdan Sen. So Anjum, that's your question, which I've answered. Before I come back to Rupandesha, I think that would be a good question to end with perhaps. Uh, Karan Jain, do we have records of the first Indian associate member or first Indian permanent member? You mentioned hmm. 65 or something. 67, uh, yeah, we actually, I, I, you know, I would have to refresh my memory. But certainly, yeah. uh, I do know, I've already mentioned, uh, I know Mr. Paul, Mr. Owen Paul is one of the first, uh, yeah. who's very much around and very active to today. Uh, but it would be, I mean, you know, I don't, I couldn't give it to you offhand, but yes, we do have the record of who was the first permanent Indian member. We also have who were associate members. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. being yeah. a permanent member for, for sort of put you into the inner circle. Okay. And then, then you had the share and okay. stake and debenture sort of thing that, that Ronald was referring to. Okay, okay. Thank you. And um, uh, one more question before we go on to Rupande's question. This is from Rajiv Soni. Uh, I think Arif needs to answer this. I had hinted at this before. Why is it that nobody from uh, Tipu Sultan's family is in an uh, eminent, prominent position now? What made their fortunes change so much? And his second question is, why did you need to build two mosques? Is it because of the locality? Different localities entirely? The, the first uh, answer to the Are first it? question, yeah, the answer to the first question would be my interpretation. Essentially what happened that since the, the endowment was broken up into two, the part which belonged to the family mm. There was nobody after Prince Gulam Mahmud who could provide that kind of a stewardship. And that's what the funds were mismanaged mm. and went uh, here and there. And please remember, that was a huge sum of money mm. that suddenly came into the hands of people who were not doing very well. However, having said that, uh, the second part of the question is not totally factually correct. There are family members which are, who are very well uh, settled in the society. They run their own business. Some of them are in the profession, but they have not been heard of. That's a different issue altogether. We only hear of those who have not done well, but there are members. In fact, the, some of the uh, descendants of uh, Prince Gulam Mahmud are also members of this very club. So there Absolutely. are people who are... Beg your pardon? Absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, they're, and they're doing very well in their life. Uh, so that is not uh, totally correct. Now coming to the, the two mosques, I think I'll have to take a, a help of a little bit of folklore there. Apparently, Prince Gulam Mahmud was also had a place where the current Kolkata station is. That's in Chitpur. And there in Chitpur, what happened that he was coming towards Taliganj, where the family members were, mm. searching for a place to set up a mosque. While coming in, they stopped their horse carriage near where the Dharantala is today. For they were, if you remember, there were huge tanks for as a stop and for to you know give water to the and the food to the horses. And while there, one of the high priests who was accompanying him 
suggested that since while coming in this, we stopped here. So as a measure of our thanksgiving to the Almighty, why don't we set up a mosque here? And that's why apparently the mosque at Dharamtala came around. And the mosque in Taliganj okay. was always in the mind of Prince Gulam Muhammad. And then he continued yeah. the journey, came over here and chose this particular place. One of the saying that the Prince okay. Gulam Thank Muhammad you, already lived there was because of proximity to this mosque. Thanks so much, Arif. I'm rushing because this is the last question from Rupande, actually the last two questions. Rupande's question is that you recently renovated the club, uh, yeah. uh, both of you, uh, Ronin and Anil. How have you balanced the renovation with the heritage? There are certain laws for heritage uh, buildings in renovation. Have you been able to balance it? And a quick question from Ikshita Ganguly. If you know, who was the first lady member? Last two questions for this evening. Ronan, you want to take it? Go very quickly. Yeah. Anil. Right. I mean, as far as uh, uh, managing the uh, heritage, it, it, it was a massive issue, actually. I mean, it, we've been banding with the idea uh, of getting it done. And then... Uh, Initially, the clubhouse was just a, a heritage property. And then subsequently, the entire estate was actually declared as a heritage uh, property. So that really put a, uh, you know, made it very difficult to get necessary clearances. So we actually had to look out, uh, look around for an art, a suitable architect who would be able to guide us through this thing. And we were very lucky in finding Mr. Dulal Mukherjee, who actually agreed to do this uh, repair uh, and uh, renovations for us. And then it, it's just like looking after, you know, an old building when you start off with something, you don't know how much you can end up, end up with. So we had to make sure that we got the clearances, managed to stick to things. For example, I mean, when we started doing the plastering, we realized that for the, maintaining the heritage, we actually had to do a specific lime plaster for which you don't actually get uh, masons to do that in Calcutta. So you had to get them brought in from outside. And uh, the amount of plastering that they did was maybe about a 10 foot by 10 foot a day. But this is going back to the original plaster that the building had uh, almost uh, 100, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up spending almost 50 lakhs on just the outside plastering of the house. So uh, it, it's been a, a labor of love and I think uh, all members of Tully are now justifiably proud of the way it's turned out. As regards the first lady member, I think Anil might might know, but I'm I'm definitely not sure. Anil? Okay, we are running out of time. I, I, I wish I did, then I could classify myself as a ladies' man, but uh, okay. I'm <laughs> okay. not sure. <laughs> but I, I, I must add to, to uh, uh, if I may add that the interiors, you know, uh, have matched the, the colonial and the old heritage of of, of Tully. And Mr. Dalal Mukherjee was the one who, you know, did the architecture without his huge knowledge and understanding he would not have got anywhere. And the design internally was done by somebody called Ami Bedi. And the two of them, the, the fusion of, of the, the architecture and the design is what we have today and justifiably of which we are all very proud. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was the first edition of Clubs and Spades. Focus being on Tolliganj Club in its 125th year. And this was brought to you by Calcutta Heritage Group, uh, group uh, Collective, which aims at infusing a love and passion for heritage, for our heritage, ours for nobody to take away, us to be proud of and preserve for generations. Thank you so much. We hope you will join us and keep joining us again and again for these sessions. Thanks and good night. <laughs>